Les from Delta here. And today we are going to talk about how to make an application or as Fisher calls it a product. The products will start from the DFMA that you've already got. If you don't know how to make a DFMA, hop over to the other video where we talk about how to do that. So with a Fisher, a product is specific to the actual application that you want to make. So if you have different coatings, different parts that you're making for customers that have different criteria, each one of those should be made into its own product. And they can all start with the same DFMA. You don't necessarily have to make a new DFMA to go with each product. Just be aware that everything that you do in that DFMA will affect every application or product that you made with that original DFMA. So let's get into how to make a product. We're going to come up to product and we're going to come down to new. Uh, you do not need to worry about what type of FISM you have. If it's a basic light, super, ultra, mega, whatever. You don't need to worry about it. Uh, that's only important when it comes to creating new DFMAs. If you already have the DFMA, you can make a new application. So from here, we could start from another application and use that as a base and do kind of like a save as new or um, save as. However, we're going to just start completely fresh. So we want to come over here to the new button and we're going to click that. And now it's going to ask us to select a DFMA. I'm going to select this uh, zinc on steel new that I made in the other video just to continue on with that. So we're going to select that and we're going to hit OK. Now, what do we want to call it? You can call it the product that you're measuring, the part you're measuring, the customer. Uh, we're going to call this one zinc on steel uh, video test and just so I can keep it separate from all the other zinc on steels that I've made. If you want, you can also change the number. Uh, some people group their products and applications by number. So one through 10 is everything that's zinc. If it's uh, over a hundred, it's gold. Typically I just let, typically I just let the software populate the next number just because that's not how I normally sort things. So we're going to hit OK. On this screen, we're going to select which collimator and or measuring distance uh, we want to work with. Uh, I'm on a Fisher XDAL on this one. Uh, measuring distance really is not an option to change in this particular unit. Uh, do have a few different collimator options. Collimator options really fall into more of an advanced parameter. So if you need to change this, you know. Rule of thumb, however, is at the very least, the entire circle of the collimator needs to fit on what you're measuring. Preferably, uh, it doesn't cover more than 50% of what you're measuring. Uh, just to make sure that you're not getting any extraneous readings from outside of this circle. We're going to leave this on a 0.6 diameter. Uh, this is also known as a 12 mil collimator. It's very, very standard, very stock collimator. Anode current, allow that to auto calculate. That allows the software to pick the best anode power to go with your application. Again, if you know what your anode current should be, you're going to know that you can uncheck this and set it to whatever you want. If you don't just leave that checkbox. So now we're going to hit OK, moving on to the next screen. At this point, we are going to now put in the calibration standards we want to use with this application. Uh, this can be particularly important if we have different substrates that we're working with, different densities of our coatings, things like that. Uh, we are going to put in two standards. As usual, our rule of thumb is we want to put in one standard that is uh, at or below our low threshold for our acceptance criteria and one that is 
above. Uh, for sake of argument, we're going to say that our acceptance criteria is uh, 200 to 500 micro inches. Uh, I have a 212 and a 474 that we're going to put in. If you have a calibration set label, you know which ones these are, um, you can put that in here and I'll show you why that becomes important later. I'm going to put the NFE, I can't type, and the serial numbers of my two standards that I'm going to put in as my label. Now we are going to come down here. Once you've got your label in, the next thing that we're going to want to do, and it's going to seem like a, a little bit out of order, but we want to come down to units. It is very, very, very important that the units that you select here match the units that are on your standards. Uh, as I said before, I have got micro inch standards. So I want to change this from microns to micro inches. If we were in mils or nanometers, Obviously, we can put it in here. User defined is, uh, again, one of those advanced options that if you need it, you know how to do it. And we would put that in there. But we're just going to change over to micro inches now and hit OK. And you can see that these have now changed over. So I want to input or overwrite uh, a standard. If we had one in here already and selected and hit this button, it would highlight and we can make any changes to it. We don't have any yet. So we're just going to click this and hit input. And it's now going to ask us, okay, what is the value in micro inches of our standard? And all you got to do is just double click in there and that will highlight. And we are going to put this one in as 212.2. And if you wanted to label it with the specific standard serial number, as opposed to the calibration set label. I want to get really specific with it. You can do that. So we're going to hit OK. And you can see that this is now in here. First number is just the value that we have set in there. These next two values of theoretical and corrected are zero. And that's because we haven't measured them yet. So there's nothing for the software to fill in. We have another standard. Again, we always want to have at least two, one at the low end and one at the high end. So let's put in our high. You can put them in in any order that you want. I prefer to work low to high, top to bottom. That way I know I have entered everything in just by doing it in a methodical order like that. And now we'll just put in our serial number. Okay. And if we had more standards, we would just keep going. I only have two. It's a single layer application. Two standards is more than enough for every layer that you have. In theory, you're going to be adding two more standards. So if we had two layers, we would have four standards, high and low for that intermediate layer as well. We're going to hit OK. And now it's going to take us into actually calibrating this application. Now, earlier in the DEFMA, we said we want to measure our pure elements. So the first thing that it's going to do is it's going to ask us for our zinc. So I'm going to throw in my pure element card. Uh, if you don't have one of these, just any piece of pure element is all that you need. We're going to get down here right into the center of this, get her into focus. While this does look really nicely in focus, we also want to hit the auto focus button. This makes sure that what the camera is seeing is actually the same focus that the x-ray beam is using uh, for repeatability. That's extremely important. And now I'll just hit start. And this is going to take measurements based on the calibration times that we put in to the 
Defame. All right, now that it's completed reading on zinc, we can see that it's now asking for steel or iron. You can see that it's starting to populate these numbers over here. X is just the number of counts that the detector has picked up off of that element in its particular channel. Uh, I'm not going, well, you know what I am, I am going to hit the autofocus button again, probably don't need to do it since we're all in the same plane. Uh, but let's be sure good best practice. And again, hit start. All right, now you can see we have finished with the steel reading. And now it is asking for the serial number that we put in during the calibration set input. And that's why if you have a label with a serial number, I would highly recommend using it makes it a little bit easier to find them. If not, this number is the thickness that we had previously input for this particular standard. I'm just going to toss both of these in here. So I've got them and you want to get to as close to the center as we can. Let's get this a little bit into focus here so we can see the standard. Uh, any manufacturer's standard will work uh, as long as they come with a traceable certificate go ahead and use them if you don't have the particular standards that you need for your application check out the links below and we can help you out with those now i'm going to take a measurement on our standard now you'll notice the measurement time for the standard is lower than for our pure elements. For the pure elements, we are going to have a consistent thickness and composition throughout. So just taking one long reading in one place isn't going to change anything as far as our results go. With the Fisher software, it takes our total calibration time and divides it across three different measurement times. And this allows us to then move to maybe a slightly different location on our standard and take multiple readings across it to get a better idea of the consistency of our standard. This is really important if you are not using a lab made standard. Uh, the standards that I'm using today, I know there is very, very little difference across the face of it, even if I were to get way out into the edge, which is never recommended. Um, but I know that we're going to get good results across it no matter what. If for some strange reason you were using a house made standard or it had a varying composition across the face, moving around like this is going to become very important to make sure that we get a good average of those counts for the coding for the software to build out its calibration curve. All right, now you can see that we finished these three. It's got the raw counts here, and then it has made this ZN1 over here. This is a theoretical value based upon the difference in the measured counts and the pure element counts. And again, again, you can see this mean value. These are all very, very close numbers. Software is now asking for our other standard, which I had already loaded in. We'll just scoot over there, do a quick focus on it and hit start. I'm just going to take all three measurements right in the same place. Cause again, I know that these standards are very consistent. All 
All right, now that we've measured all of our standards, it's going to pop back up this input calibration set window again. And now you'll see that our theoretical and corrected values are now populated. So this theoretical value is this average number that we got from our three measurements on our standard. And this is just straight based off of the theoretical value that's calculated by the software. Well, we know what these standards actually should measure because they're certified standards. So it's then correcting them up to, so it is now correcting them up to this certified value. We're done. We're going to hit OK now. Now it's going to say, all right, where do we want to create this product? You can have multiple directories if you had different customers if you want to group by codings you can make new directories and fill them in there i'm just going to leave this in the dsa folder that i've made and i'm going to leave the name what i had already created back at the beginning and we're going to hit okay and now it's going to load us into that application this product that we made previously. The one thing that I want to point out is what we had talked about earlier when we were naming this calibration set. Now here underneath all of our results, it tells us what calibration set we used for this application. This can become very important when you have multiple calibration sets, multiple standards, uh, multiple variations. And you want to just quick reference what calibration set am I using? It's also helpful when you go to hit calibrate, you know which set you need to have in front of you when you go to calibrate. Now we've gone through the calibration and while I would love to trust everything that we did, I always like to verify. So I have our middle check standard that we are going to use to test our application. Let's get this little guy in focus here. And again, let's move to the center. Autofocus, again, making sure that what we're seeing is the same focal distance away from the tube and detector to make sure that we're measuring at the same height we calibrated at. I'm going to hit start. It's going to take a quick 10 second reading. And this is just to verify that the calibration went correctly. And this is something that you could do on a daily or weekly basis just to verify your calibration. I would recommend taking maybe five to 10 measurements for this. We are just going to take the one to see how we did. Three, two, five. I got a three, one, three is 96% so that's plus minus 5%. This calibration is good. Less from Delta, thanks for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss any of our calibration and equipment solution videos. Video didn't answer your questions? That's okay. Click the link below, go to our website, you can contact us through there or our Facebook page.